Yeah, the work that I do is supported by NASA, and it's really the only program that supports research on uh, how life began. The reason for that is that uh, we think that there might be life on Mars. And if we understand how life began on the Earth, we might know what to look for when we explore Mars and see whether there might be life elsewhere. So my uh, work has to do with how life began, and I'm uh, very much interested, therefore, in the chemistry and the biochemistry of life today and of life uh, that may have been on the Earth about three and a half billion years ago. What we're specializing in is a process called self-assembly. Now anybody who's uh, blown a soap bubble has made a self-assembled structure. And if you've never seen a soap bubble in your life, you'd be astonished that putting a little puff of air through uh, some soapy water produces this lovely structure we call a soap bubble. And soap bubbles are made of soap. They're made of soap molecules. Soap molecules have this ability to self-assemble. Nothing tells them how to make a, self, a soap bubble, but they, are, they have chemical properties physical properties that allow them to self-assemble into the structure called a soap bubble. Now, on the early Earth, some four billion years ago, before life began, we think that there were molecules like soap being delivered to the Earth by meteorites and being produced on the Earth by volcanic processes. These compounds, which were very definitely like soap, we know they're there because uh, we can extract them from meteorites, for example, uh, have the ability to self-assemble into microscopic bubbles. We call these vesicles. They are virtually the same as what we would call a cell membrane in the sense that they're round, they encapsulate a volume, and there must have been something like this going on if cellular life was to begin on the early Earth. There had to be a source of self-assembling molecules. Now when we think back four billion years to uh, the Earth just before life began, what we think we know about it is that the Earth was volcanic. Now I got a chunk of lava here that I collected in Iceland this summer. Lava is of course a very common mineral in a volcanic region like uh, uh, Iceland and, and Hawaii in fact, and we think that the land masses on the early Earth, early Earth were volcanic land masses made of stuff like this. So this is the mineral portion of the Earth, and yet we can say, how did this get here? Well, we think that the uh, stuff that made up the early Earth was made from material like this. This is a chunk of the Murchison meteorite that fell in Australia in 1969, and this is what I study in my laboratory. The Murchison meteorite is a stony meteorite, and it's about 2% organic carbon. And that's something not a lot of people know, is that organic material is being delivered to the Earth right now as we speak, just as it was being delivered about four billion years ago. So we think that this organic material that we have in meteorites that we can extract is similar to the kinds of molecules that would have been available on the early Earth. And that's what we study. If we take those molecules, extract them from the meteorite, allow them to interact with water, what we discover is that they form microscopic bubbles, just like big soap bubbles, except at the cellular size level. So we think that this might have been the way that the first cell membranes on the early Earth came to be, and that would have been the start of cellular life. We can think about the uh, kinds of ideas that are being brought forward by creationists and by uh, intelligent design people. And intelligent design is interesting to me because they are working at a molecular level. So it's taken creationism down to a level that uh, I work at, for example, the level of molecules. And uh, the idea that is being presented there is that certain molecules are so complex that they could not possibly have been produced by uh, evolutionary processes. So, you know, that's an idea. And uh, as a scientist, I look at that idea and I say, well, this is sort of like a judgment call to me. They are judging that these uh, molecules are too complex to have been produced by evolutionary processes, but the judgment is not subject to experimental test. And so as a scientist, I look at that idea, I look at this judgment call on their part that is too complex, and I say, well, how, how am I gonna test that? 
Now there is an interesting molecule that I've worked with called the ATP synthase. And this is a molecule that makes energy available to uh, virtually all organisms on the earth, uh, at least all cellular organisms. Uh, we uh, use a little motor, it's like a little spinning, uh, almost like a little machine. And it can take uh, two molecules and link them together to make a high energy molecule called ATP. And this has been suggested to be an example of something that is too complex to understand. Now the thing about that judgment call is that it ends the process of questioning. You've got your answer. It's too complex. We'll never understand it. And that's not very satisfying to a scientist. We can look at that ATP synthase, as some of my colleagues have, and say, well, if that ATP synthase was produced by an evolutionary process, we should see simpler versions of it. We should be able to look back in time and find, by prediction, find things that uh, make sense with respect to what we know about it now. That has been done. We are now looking back in time using uh, the methods of molecular biology. And what we discover is that there were precursor genes to other kinds of enzymes that have now evolved into the uh, ATP synthase. So this is a direct refutation of the intelligent design claim that things are too complex to understand. The fact is, when we try, we can understand them.